Mondays are great days for everyone. Um, we, uh, what we need to do today is we need to finish up our chapter 22, our discussion on bacteria. It should not take us long. And then we will enter into our material on protease. And uh, you'll notice that when we get into there, structurally, some of the material I actually push to the end of our discussion of the chapter, even though it appears at the beginning of the chapter, for a couple of reasons. One uh, is your, your uh, homework question actually begins right at the beginning of the chapter, and I want to give you some time to interact with that material before I, uh, I, ruin, I ruin you uh, with regards to that question. And then uh, two... Um, I, I don't think it's a discussion you're equipped to have until you know a little bit more about the structure of protease. Even though it appears right at the beginning of the chapter in this text, uh, I think it's, it's something better to actually be presented at the end uh, when you've been able to talk a little bit about single-celled eukaryotic organisms. What does that mean? What does it mean to be eukaryotic? What do they have? Uh, you know, um, and some of, those, some of those questions before I start talking about where did they come from. Uh, any structural things? So the homework is posted on Canvas. Did I put the slides on Canvas? Okay. Slides are on Canvas as well. Um, I, I modified a couple of slides because then when I went through them again, I realized that the, uh, that the images in them were actually lower resolution. So I went on and got some higher resolution images to put on them, but I didn't change the one on Canvas. So you'll get to some section where a couple of slides, the resolution is pretty low. Um, I'm sorry. It just happened. Another thing I need to apologize for, I warned you about this a couple of weeks ago, uh, but I told you there are going to be mornings where my brain isn't at working as quickly as I would hope it would. T today is one of those mornings. I don't know what that's going to mean, uh, but we'll... <laughs> We'll soon find out. So it's it's been so far it's been fun so far sitting at my desk trying to think through things and it's just not working as well as it normally does. So, I'll, yeah, we'll we'll probably have some fun. All right, let me pray for us. <clears throat> Father God, I, I I can't help but uh, but think about what happened uh, 16 years ago today. Father, I know that uh, uh, many of the, the people in this room were probably too young to remember that, but Father. I, I, I remember it well, and I know today there are people hurting. Uh, there are people hurting um, and still questioning and, and still searching for answers. And Father, I just pray that uh, you would just continue to um, open doors and opportunities for people to speak love and to show grace uh, in people's lives. I know um, typically no amount of time uh, is long enough uh, to get over a serious loss. And Father, I just, I, I, I can't ask you enough that uh, you would just, with your spirit, give me and, and all of us wisdom in, in, in terms of uh, helping people to see you, uh, helping people to see your love. And, and Father, I know that's it's not always easy. And uh, Father, I know that in this class, we have a really unique opportunity uh, to, to get to interact with you in, a, in, a, in an interesting way. Father, I know your word teaches us that you reveal yourself to us through your creation. And uh, your, your word isn't exactly clear how much we can actually know about you from your creation, but it is clear that we can uh, know some aspect of who you are through your creation. Father, equip us. As we have this opportunity, don't allow us to waste it. Don't allow us to overlook the incredible privilege that is and with it equip us equip us to be better stewards of 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 your grace and father when there are people hurting uh, help the understanding we have of you uh, encourage us to know how we can uh, speak to others we ask this in the name of jesus amen all right so we left off here uh talking about biofilms and biofilms uh, appears multiple times in chapter 22 very early on in a discussion of um, your extremophiles these bacteria that will build these large microbial mats around hydrothermal vents and in other places and then it just keeps appearing and and we left our discussion of it off until uh, we're talking about okay, well, what does that mean as far as uh, human health is concerned and uh, here, when we talk about biofilms, uh, two, there are two real um, issues that you have to be mindful of with regards to biofilm. One 
is it makes it extremely difficult to wash bacteria off of food. Okay, so that's one issue. And then another issue you have to be aware of is that there are some diseases that most of the pathology is associated with the biofilm itself. And so we left off here, cystic fibrosis, lung disease, Legionnaire's disease, a, um, a, a, a type of pneumonia uh, that goes along with an infection with Legionella, uh, otitis media, which is a middle ear infection, one of the most common uh, types of ear infections, and then dental plaques. Uh, these illnesses where the pathology itself is a result of uh, the biofilm and not necessarily secretions from the bacteria. Okay. Uh, and yeah, and then the other thing that you need to be aware of, and, and I mentioned this already, is that biofilms make bacteria difficult to remove from food items. And so there are particular what you would call serotypes, <clears throat> uh, a word that's synonymous with strains. Uh, you don't usually hear the word serotype very often. It's S-E-R-O-T-Y-P-E. Uh, I is a great example of that. Uh, you have uh, e. coli infections or e. coli outbreaks all the time. Uh, e. coli, there we go. Uh, e. coli is actually an incredibly common, what you would call normal flora, uh, a bacterium that is just a part of... Uh, our bacteria community, our microbiome. And yet there are certain strains or certain serotypes of it uh, that are incredibly pathogenic. Uh, and the nice thing about E. coli is actually that it does make a biofilm because as part of our normal bacterial flora, that biofilm that E. coli makes, uh, makes it difficult for other bacteria to infect you. Uh, it actually contributes another barrier by which your body is protected from foreign material. But there are some serotypes or some strains of E. coli that are pathogenic. Uh, Clostridium botulinum, <clears throat> it's the bacteria that makes the toxin that contributes to the disease botulism. And up until recently, nobody had ever shown uh, this bacteria to make a uh, biofilm in nature. Uh, but just a couple of years ago, uh, work done in the lab and work done on this organism, what you would call in situ, where it actually lives, uh, demonstrated this bacteria making biofilms and um, making it difficult uh, to, to <coughs> eliminate this. This, this bacterium is, is anaerobic, meaning it loves uh, oxygen-depleted environments. Uh, and most of the botulism infections actually come from eating improperly canned foods. Okay? So you've got an oxygen-poor environment and a bacterium that if you don't heat that environment up well enough before the canning process, that just thrives in those kinds of conditions. But then this is also the toxin that we make Botox from. I think I mentioned that, but uh, yeah, it's an interesting toxin. And so uh, here's a figure right out of the text that, that demonstrates this, this biofilm making process. Uh, and there's some, there's some important stuff going on. So in step one, the bacteria are basically just hanging out on that surface, uh, choosing a place on the surface of where to act. But step two, they actually start making materials that permanently anchor them uh, to that material. And what we mean by permanently anchor is that bacteria do, can't move themselves off of. I mean, you can move them if you use something to wash them really well. You could remove them, but the bacteria don't move themselves. And then these bacteria start forming, start growing out of control, start forming that extracellular matrix that's going to feed and protect uh, the bacteria inside of that bio matrix. And then step four, uh, that, that biofilm gets more complex uh, starts to take on a really uh, weird shape, almost like a living organism. And then step five, this is where you start to get the biofilms big enough that it can actually reproduce. And that's what's going on. Bacterial individuals are leaving that biofilm and are going to start a biofilm elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And so keep in mind that uh, when you're talking about pathology associated with the biofilm, these are massive structures. And so bacterial cells are tiny. But biofilms can be huge, right? We talked about those microbial mats around hydrothermal vents. It can be more than a meter thick. Meters over three feet. So you're talking about three feet thick 
just solid mass of bacterial cells and extracellular matrix. Okay, and so these could be huge structures, and a lot of the time that's what contributes to the pathology, just having this massive structure uh, inhibiting normal function. Yeah, or if this is going on inside your middle ear, that's a big problem. Yeah. That's a really, really small structure. Yeah. So basically, these biofilms are analogous to anteater, or not anteater, but um, termite mounds. Uh, I, I mean, in in some ways, yeah. I mean, an analogies are an interesting thing in that. Uh, it's very seldom that you find a really good analogy. And so in some ways, in terms of uh, the rate at which they can grow, that when they get to a certain size, they'll start to reproduce. Sure, there are some similarities there, uh, but there are certainly some definite differences. Uh, for instance, and, and termites, um, most of the individuals in a termite colony are unusually closely related. Uh, and it's because of... of um, Inbreeding. There we go. That's the word I'm looking for. Uh, because of inbreeding, uh, that usually one of the parents of the colony is also a sibling of all the others. And so you get unusually high relatedness. But in a biofilm, oftentimes all of the individuals of a particular species are clones of one another. So they're genetically identical. So you do have some, some really unique and, and meaningful differences. Yeah. Um, it's not necessarily what makes it effective against bacteria. It's what it allows water to do. So the, the, the big thing is soap does uh, two things when you, when you wash with soap. One is that soap is um, amphoteric, meaning it interacts with both polar and nonpolar materials. So it can interact chemically with nonpolar materials, which water cannot. And so that's why soap can actually grab hold of materials and pull them out of solution or force them into solution, uh, and then they can mix in the water. So that's one thing soap does. Another thing soap does is uh, it, it, it disrupts the water molecules from making and breaking hydrogen bonds as easily as they could without it. So it actually makes individual water molecules a bit more free to move, which helps water to better penetrate really small nooks and crannies. Uh, so it's not necessarily what soap does to the bacteria. It's what it allows the water to do. It makes water actually wash better. Um, because the soap can interact with nonpolar <coughs> materials, which a lot of the biofilm components, especially the glue that's holding it on, uh, a lot of that's nonpolar. It also allows water to penetrate better. That's a good question. Uh, and so here, uh, just, you know, the most important diagram here is this is a particular strain or serotype, if you will, uh, of E. coli, a different one uh, than we talked about previously. But a lot of these uh, E. coli strains... Um, are, are pathogenic, and, and that's tough because it's something our body is used to having around, and yet now it's secreting some kind of a toxin that's contributing to pathology, and that's really difficult. When you have something your immune system is used to being there, and now it's doing something that it's, it's, it's not really supposed to do. So that's what can make it particularly dangerous. All right, the last... Uh, framing question from chapter 22. What positive role do bacteria play? <laughs> Bless you. Uh, one, uh, and I mentioned this last time, life, as, as we know, it wouldn't be possible without nitrogen-fixing bacteria. Basically, the entire nitrogen cycle, every step, if nitrogen is going to move from gaseous nitrogen to ammonia, uh, you need bacteria. If it's going to move from ammonia to nitrate, nitrate to nitrite, nitrite back to atmospheric nitrogen, bacteria are responsible for all of that. Okay, So nitrogen cycle doesn't work without bacteria. If the nitrogen cycle doesn't work, you don't have nitrogen to build your biomolecules. You don't live. Right. So what positive role do bacteria play? I mean, they make life possible. That seems pretty good. Right? I like that. You ought to like that, too. And this is probably a more important one. Cheese wouldn't exist without bacteria, right? And if cheese didn't exist, life sure could work, but man, it wouldn't be as worth living as it is with, the, with cheese, right? Call it life. It'd be more yeah, like it'd be more like surviving, right? It's like, yeah, yeah, it's not really life, it's just not dying, right? Yeah. You wouldn't have steaks. Yeah, I mean, you wouldn't be able to age them that's the same way. Yeah, which that would be sad. I mean, a steak that's not aged properly, it just doesn't... Yeah, so bio, this, uh, this area of using uh, bacteria 
uh, to make certain food products or to make other products is called biotechnology. And you just find it in, in almost everything you use, bacteria play an integral role in making those products, including cheese. And then you've got what's called bioremediation, using prokaryotes, although usually bacteria, uh, to clean up a mess, to clean up oil spills, to clean up mercury pollution, to clean up a, a number of other pollutants. If, if you can find a pollutant, chances are you can find a bacteria that eats that. And that's what's nice, is uh, you just, you allow that bacteria that loves to eat oil to go to where your oil spill is, and it cleans it up for you, bioremediation. And then, Bringing it back to us as individuals, uh, we have literally billions, maybe hundreds of billions, trillions of, of prokaryotes making up our microbiome. And so uh, without these normal flora, pathogenic bacteria grow out of control, like Clostridium difficile, C. diff. And so if you've ever known anybody who's contracted C. diff or you've read a story about somebody who contracted C. diff or you've seen some of the... Um, ramifications of that. I mean, it is a very, very serious uh, intestinal issue, and it's virtually impossible if your gut bacteria are even remotely close to what they ought to be. So, but the reality is very few of us have gut bacteria that are close to the way they ought to be, and so this is what makes C. diff so dangerous. And so, uh, easily spread, so contagious, is because most of our gut bacteria are not anywhere close to what they should be for a number of reasons. A big one because we eat food that's just literally saturated in antibiotics. Yeah? So in the same way that like we should eat things for our body, take care of it, we should really be taking care of our bacteria. Absolutely. Yeah, and I, and I, and I made this statement last week uh, that I think you can make an argument that you are not fully biologically human without a normal gut microbiome. And if that's true, then that gut microbiome is just as much a part of you as your own cells are. Right? Okay. So like what kind of, I don't like without going too much into detail, like what kind of things like are we doing to like our harm our bacteria? Uh overuse of antibiotics, right, is a big one. Um just eating really uh, preservative rich foods uh right and um not eating foods that are particularly high in probiotics that are designed to actually feed that gut bacteria yeah all right so here uh here's a uh, a root system from soybeans uh with a number of structures here these nodules and these nodules are full of nitrogen fixing bacteria and so not only do bacteria actually make that nitrogen available to plants, oftentimes they live in structures that the plants make, like a little condominium for the bacteria to live in. It's fantastic. And then so food industry, cheese, wine, beer, bread, all of these things, uh, that bacteria play an extremely large role uh, in helping produce. Oil spills. And this is just showing you some of the devastation of an oil spill, not really demonstrating how bacteria can clean these up. But the nice thing is oil and water don't mix. Well, that's actually not nice. The nice thing is that when bacteria eat the oil, the byproduct is something that's water soluble. So you have this material that doesn't mix with water, the bacteria eat it, and the product that they, that's left over actually dissolves in water. And then you can just kind of you know, clean it up really easily. Uh, or a lot of bacteria will actually get it to a point where um, it doesn't mix with the water, but actually forms kind of almost like a solid material that floats, and you can just kind of walk around and, and skim it off. Yeah. So do soaps like uh, Dawn soap that are not broken to take out oils have bacteria in it? No. So the Dawn soap is just incredibly well designed to do the first role that I said that soap does, and that's to interact with both polar and nonpolar materials. Don's just really well designed for that. And so it does a good job of taking nonpolar materials and actually helping them to dissolve in water. Yeah. And then here is Clostridium difficile, uh, C. diff, uh, a gram positive bacterium. <coughs> yeah, causing severe diarrhea and, and really just a, a, lot of, um, a, a lot of gut distress. I mean, it just really distorts a lot of what your gut is supposed to do. 
uh, and, and makes that very difficult. All right. Well, that's it for chapter 22. So are there any questions from chapter 22? Yeah. Okay. So can I back into some question? Yep. So like sometimes you go to the store and there's like cleaners that are like, you know, antibacterial or like kills 99% of bacteria. Yeah, those are disappearing. By the way, those are, within five years, you probably will have a very difficult time finding soaps that are antibacterial. Okay, so those soaps aren't really, is, is it the, like, are, are those products like Lysol, like, is that actually killing bacteria? Yes, yep, okay. yep, they've got some antibiotics in them. Okay. Yep. And that's why they're disappearing, is that's part of the overuse of, of antibiotics. And it's, not, it's causing bacteria, it's causing strength of bacteria. Yes, so it's not causing the presence of the resistance, but it's causing more of the population to be made up of resistant oh, individuals. Because those that we want to be in abundance are dying off. Right. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So when we get to a point in the future where we just can't find any... Uh, a lot of people think we're at that point now, which is why you have bacterial resistant strains of bacteria that are really easy to fight that will just move through hospitals. Um, for instance, uh, man, I think it was like three or four years ago now, there's a hospital in Baltimore uh, that a very uh, simple to fight bacterial infection, I forget which bacteria it was, uh, but just moved through the hospital and killed dozens of people before they could figure out what was actually going on and what was contributing to that. Uh, and yeah, so a lot of people think we're already at that point. But it, you would imagine it's probably only going to get worse until we start to use something other than uh, anti uh, antibiotics for combating bacterial infections. So with people with stronger immune systems, would they? Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, there are some people that aren't as impacted. Let's use MRSA as an example, methicillin resistant Staph aureus, right? There are some people that aren't as susceptible to that as others, certainly so. Um, but that's that's a more minor issue than the one that's the reality of like we have this bacteria that we we can't we can't treat with the main way we treat bacteria right so we have to kind of think about, about a more unique and creative way to do this and it's usually done by just using a whole suite of different antibiotics is usually how they treat MRSA yeah so this hippie diet movement of drinking kombucha and all that actually has value to it? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, thinking, I mean, thinking about how do you feed your gut bacteria is helpful. Yeah. Because, yeah. like, I, like, in America, like, we're so obsessed, like, we're such germaphobes, like, we just want to clean everything. And we think, is that kind of the same with bacteria? That's well, be careful with generalizations, way. because, like, I like okay. to roll my food in the dirt <laughs> and, and eat it. So when you're talking to me right. and you say we, I don't identify with that. Okay. Yeah. Some people. Um, but like, there's a lot of emphasis on like cleaning everything. Sure. And, and you think to some extent that's kind of harmful. Yes. Yeah. You have what's called um, the old friends hypothesis, uh, and it basically goes this this way: that during the early stages of your life, there are certain pathogens you need to be exposed to and need to get a little bit sick. But these things are basically designed in such a way that they've been part of the human experience for a long time and it's part of what's supposed to maybe chicken pox uh, but it's it's part of what's supposed to make sure your immune system gets designed properly huh. and uh, keeping yourself <laughs> from those old friends in a way makes it to where your immune system does not develop properly it does not mature properly and so by the time you get to the point where your immune system is supposed to be fully matured and there isn't a lot of maturation happening anymore uh it's it's too late and a lot of people think that that explains a big reason for why autoimmune diseases allergies are just so much more common in the developed world than they are in you know other places although some people will counter that and say yeah well somebody who's starving to death isn't going to notice that they're allergic to you know uh i don't know carrots because like they've got a much bigger issue to deal with so is that the whole story no but i think yeah it is a contributing factor for sure all right we got to keep going keep chugging along chapter 23 uh dealing with with protists and so 
Uh, yeah, here are the, the framing questions. There are six of them, like there were in the previous chapter. Uh, how does the structure and reproductive strategy vary with environmental stability? Do eukaryotes evidence universal common descent well? How are Giardia well designed for their lifestyle? And uh, we'll go over, that's about the three we'll be able to get through today, and I don't even know if we'll be able to get to that third one, so we'll come back uh, to the latter three on Wednesday. So this first one, uh, how does structure and reproduct reproductive strategy uh, vary with environmental stability? Okay, first we just need to talk about what is a protist. And so here's the thing. Any eukaryote that isn't an animal, a plant, or a fungus is a protist. And so this is just a crazy assortment of different organisms. It's basically the miscellaneous section on your computer, right? Or it's the junk drawer in your kitchen. It's like, is this a cooking utensil? Not really. Let's put it in the junk drawer, right? Do you all have a junk drawer in your kitchen growing up? I've got two of them because I have a lot of junk, right? And it's just like that miscellaneous drawer. And that's, this is the junk drawer of, of eukaryotes. Um, and so because of that, you ought to expect that there should just be a wide variety of different forms, different strategies, uh, different uh, lifestyles in this group. And there are. So because of that, cell structure actually varies a great deal among protists. Uh, but those that live in what you would call extreme environments, less predictable, uh, with a lot more varying conditions or with conditions that are outside of the norm for most living organisms, a lot of these individuals have shells or pellicles. And so shells are really hard, rigid structure that uh, makes it hard to crush them. Pellicles are a less hard but still rigid structure makes it really hard to tear them. Okay, And so either way, these are signs of either a, an extreme environment in, in terms of maybe a lot of predation uh, or an extreme environment in this that the, the conditions change so wildly, right? right? If you heat something and you cool it, you heat it, it expands, you cool it, it, it contracts, right? Expand, contract, expand, contract, and you have a lot of this going on in really unpredictable environments. And so that can be really hard on a single cell, right? We've got a benefit that a lot of our cells are held in a really stable environment because they're inside of our bodies. And the cells exposed to that are usually just dead cells, packed full of material that helps protect the cells underlying them. And uh, that, that can be really hard, heating and cooling and heating and cooling. Uh, metabolic strategies also vary with environment, uh, but a lot of these include phagocytosis, except uh, in the protists that are purely photoautotrophic. And going back to our uh, little chart from last week, what does photoautotrophic mean? First, the photo, where are they getting their energy from? Sunlight, autotrophic, where are they getting their carbon from? Well, they're not making the carbon, they're making their biomolecules, they're getting it from carbon dioxide. Okay? They're getting their carbon from carbon dioxide and not from organic materials. Okay? And so for protists that are photoautotrophic, uh, they, do not go, they do not have phagocytosis, but any uh, protist that is not photoautotrophic uh, is, is going to... Uh, eat by phagocytosin. It may be where they're getting their energy uh, or uh, it, it may be where they're getting their carbon source or, or both. Then you have a number of protists that are what are called mixotrophs. Mixotrophs giving you the idea that it's a, it's a mixture. It's an assortment of different feeding strategies. And so these can uh, basically feed in multiple ways. They can make their own uh, biomolecules by maybe uh, going through photosynthesis or chemosynthesis, uh, or they can eat materials to get their carbon source, depending on what's available. And I'll show you phagocytosis in a little bit. I'll show you a diagram, uh, and you can see what this feeding looks like. Now, most protists move in response to stimuli, in response to, say, a light stimulus uh, or a mechanical stimulus, or a pressure stimulus, and this is called taxis. That movement in response to a stimulus uh, is called taxis. So phototaxis would be moving in response to what? Light. Love it, right? And you, you could say they are positive phototactic, meaning they move towards light, or you can say they're negative phototactic, meaning they move away from light. Okay? 
Make sense? All coming from this word taxis. And so you'll see those terms, and that's what we're basically referencing, this idea of moving in response to some kind of a stimulus. And then uh, probably one of the most important uh, variations within produce uh, in response to environmental conditions is, is reproductive strategy. So a number of protists can reproduce both asexually and sexually. And in asexual reproduction, they are basically generating clones of themselves. There are a number of ways they can do that, and, and, uh, and you can go through that and, and see that. It's, it's usually by binary fission. Binary meaning two. Fission means to, like, to cut uh, or to, um, to split. And so in binary fission, you usually just split one individual into two, okay, into two genetically identical. There are some that do asexual reproduction in different ways, but binary fission is the norm. But many species can, again, both reproduce sexually and asexually, and they will tend to reproduce sexually uh, at certain times of the year, times that correspond with when the environment starts to shift a great deal, when it becomes a lot less predictable and so, um, yeah, a couple of reasons why this happens or why it's beneficial that this happens is one, it allows new combinations. So if you're just making genetic copies of yourself, your offspring are only going to be able to respond to the environment like you respond to the environment, which if you're nailing it, right, if you're like, yeah, I got this, right, it doesn't matter that food is scarce, I'm going to get that food, right? It doesn't matter that predators are abundant because you're like, you know what, I got this, right? And so your offspring are going to do a great job. But if you're lacking in some ability and all of your offspring are genetically identical to yourself, they are lacking in that ability as well. Sexual reproduction allows you to shuffle your deck with somebody else's, get some unique combinations. And so you may produce offspring that are better equipped than you are. And then another one is sexual reproduction also coincides with cyst formation. A lot of these protists can wait out the harsh time of the year by basically making a cyst around um, either the cell formed after sexual reproduction or the cells they make in preparation for sexual reproduction. Basically wrap it in a cyst, protect it from the environment, allow it to wait out. You find this a lot in uh, protists that live in freshwater environments in areas where the freshwater freezes over in the wintertime. You'll find a lot of the time in preparation for that, they'll go through sexual reproduction, they'll make cysts, the water will freeze over, those cysts will just kind of sink to the bottom of the lake, and then when spring comes around, the conditions are right, the cysts open up, and the individual comes out and starts tearing life apart like its parents were. Yeah, in some way, yep. It's, yeah, it's hibernation that, that kind of coincides with, uh, with a reproductive strategy. Yeah. So is the cyst kind of like what... Um bacteria do when they find an environment unsuitable yes so that yep kind of yep okay. absolutely yeah and we oftentimes use that that same term as well for bacteria okay uh for cyst formation yeah you find this a lot in parasites too so parasites in preparation for their offspring leaving the host will wrap their offspring in a cyst so when you're actually say you take your pet to the vet and they've got like something really wrong right they're like you're you're like my cat hasn't had a solid stool in like a week and and I, you're like you, that's never something you should ever have to tell someone i get that uh but it's usually an indication that something is not right and then they check their feces and they're just millions of cysts of giardia and they're like well your cat has giardia and that's why it's you know got some really interesting bowel issues uh, going on all right so here is phagocytosis and so uh, basically, the almost almost like arms, we call them actually feet, pseudo, pseudopodia, which means fake feet, but it, whole extensions of the cell surround some object that's rather large, and basically once this completes its circle around this, it just brings it in as now a membrane-wrapped vesicle. And then this will go infuse with a uh, organelle called a lysosome that's full of digestive enzymes, uh, it'll fuse with that. Now you have what's called a phagolysosome. Okay, this is a phagosome. This is a lysosome. This is a phagolysosome, right? Isn't that fantastic? You just love that, don't you? And then uh, it'll go through and digest whatever's in there and release those components to the cell for the cell to use. Anything that's undigested will 
be exocytosed from the cell. And so in almost all of your produce, protist, produce, protist, <laughs> Uh, this is the, the way in which they get their organic molecules, where they are getting their carbon source. Unless, of course, they're autotrophic and their carbon is coming from carbon dioxide. So talked about that almost all produce, protists uh, move in response to stimuli. There are three big strategies. There are cilia, uh, which are basically thousands of uh, <coughs> structures uh, that undulate on the side of the membrane and propel this in a particular direction. Or they can move by sending out those pseudopods, those fake feet, the same way they would eat and do phagocytosis, but they can just move their entire cell in a particular direction that way. Uh, or they can move using what's called a flagellum, which structurally, cilia and flagella are structurally identical, just flagella tend to uh, be large compared to the size of the organism and few in number. Okay. Cilia tend to be small relative to the size of the organism and many in number. All right? But these are the three main locomotion strategies uh, to move in response to a stimulus. All right? No questions? Yeah, I knew there was one. Which one's faster, cilia or Okay. Um, there's there's a there's a there's a relationship between locomotion strategy and size. Uh, organisms that move with flagella are the smallest of all of the protists. Okay. Uh, these and then these two are usually I mean pretty comparable in size, with these being sometimes bigger, sometimes smaller. But these are by far the smallest. And so relative to the size of the organisms, these are the fastest. But just in terms of overall, I don't know. You know, it'd be like comparing, I mean, and I guess you could do it, but it'd be kind of interesting. It'd be like, you know, trying to compare, you know, the speed of a, like an aircraft carrier to a sprinter. It's like, yeah, you could do it, but that comparison might be meaningless, <coughs> right? Okay. The aircraft carrier is moving really slow compared to its size. The sprinter is moving really fast compared to its size. Is an aircraft carrier faster than a sprinter? Maybe, but that comparison is, uh, yeah. And I know you, what you're thinking, you're like, well, moving through an environment, it does kind of matter. But yeah, it'd be a hard comparison to make. It'd be hard to get them to actually behave well enough to race for you. <laughs> and so here is uh, an example of sexual reproduction. This is probably some of the most complex sexual reproduction that happens uh, inside a protist. These are paramecia. And paramecia are ciliates. You can see they're the same organism that we just saw in the previous slide representing those that move with cilia. Um, they, they're called, uh, what, what's, what's the term, uh, slipper shaped. They almost look like house shoes uh, or like flip-flop shaped. And so what happens when these organisms reproduce sexually, not only do they exchange genetic material, which you can see happening here with the arrows showing the exchange of genetic material, but these organisms are, are interesting in that they have two different types of nuclei. They have a large nucleus called the macronucleus, which is where most of the uh, exchange is going from stored genetic material to putting that material into action. And then they have micronuclei, small nuclei, that are taking part in the genetic exchange. But during reproduction, the macronuclei actually disintegrate and then get replaced by the micronuclei. So in terms of genetic components, the micronuclei contain all of the necessary genetic components, um, but they just, they're not active in when the cell's taking stored information and putting it into action. They're only active when you're mixing that genetic information. So during this sexual reproduction, the macronucleus disintegrates, and then the micronuclei uh, divide, copy themselves, and some of them become macronuclei, and then more divisions take place to generate daughters that are um, genetically identical. So these daughters would all be genetically identical to each other. Ide well, actually, that's not necessarily true. That's not true at all. Don't write that down. I just lied to you. It, I apologize. I'm sorry. Um, because some of these micronuclei are going to come from one individual and some of them came from the individual in the first place. And so the macronuclei that develop from those micronuclei should be genetically 
distinct. Yeah. Does this say pitch just for pain uh, That's a good question. Uh, as far as this goes, uh, I don't know if this specific type of sexual reproduction has been demonstrated in any other protus, uh, but you have some similar patterns. Yeah, but the whole idea with sexual reproduction is that you, you, you have to find some way of mixing uh, that, that genetic material. And so this is the way paramecium <coughs> do it. So it says in number one that uh, you have two different types of uh, mating uh, types of uh -huh. people. Um, can they switch back and forth between yes. those two types? Okay. Yep, yep. So they're hermaphrodite. Did they? Would you call uh, that? Sort of, I mean, they don't have male and female okay. because... Uh, <laughs> This is, a, this is actually a really good question. We're, we, you know what? We're going to do this right now. Okay. Thank you for this, Jack. This leads me to something. This is going to be a fun lecture break. Okay? Ooh, this is... Yeah. Is, anyways. Okay. So what I would like for you to do is just, just thinking in your head. We're not going to actually take the time for you to sort this out with those around you. I'd like you to take about a minute and think through what do you need present in order to define male and female? What do you need? What has to be present in order for you to actually say this individual is male, this individual is female? Okay, 30 seconds to a minute. All right, now I will tell you that you cannot do it for single-celled organisms. It's just, there's, there's, there's just, usually. I, I just actually thought of a single-celled organism in which you could, uh, but you usually <laughs> cannot uh, because there is one way to do it objectively that's better than any other. So what do we got? How do you do it? How would you say male versus female for an organism? Yeah. And that is the single best way to do it objectively. That male is the sex that produces the small gamete. Now, it, it, sperm has a specific meaning, and so you need a flagellated gamete uh, that's capable of, of moving, right, for it to qualify as sperm. But it is a small gamete, and females produce the large gamete. Okay, And that is the single best way to define male versus female in organisms. And so here, you don't really have a way of characterizing male versus female. First of all, they completely swap genetic information. It's not like one is getting the genetic material and one is contributing it. They completely swap, exchange it, and there are no gametes produced. It'd be virtually impossible to try to determine male and female. What you do is you just determine what basically their position uh, in in the this is called conjugation, by the way. I don't know if they if they wrote that uh, in that description. They do not. Uh, but this process is called conjugation. Yeah. So what about uh, sequences? Well, it's still the same way. It's just after the eggs are fertilized, the male takes them into a brooding pouch. Oh, okay. So the fertilization takes place externally, like it does in many fish. Um, and then after the eggs are fertilized, the male puts them in a, in a brooding patch, uh, a brooding pouch, and then stores them until the eggs hatch. Hmm. Yeah. Yep. So for um, this cycle, does, does each one basically become like the offspring itself before switching? Cause they're, they're, they're yeah, I mean, each one is genetically distinct from what it was at the beginning of the process. Yes. Yep. Yep. <coughs> All right. So, do eukaryotes evidence universal common descent well? And uh, a simple answer to this question is just, is just no. Like, they, they, don't, they don't at all. That's not all that's on this slide. It's like, no. Uh, I'll tell you why. Uh, first of all, you used to have a kingdom. So, you had the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, the fungal kingdom, 
and then Kingdom Protista. That kingdom no longer exists. Uh, with genetic material um, contributing to the discussion of how organisms are related, uh, that kingdom was just basically destroyed. And, and so nobody tries to put these organisms into a kingdom anymore. And yeah, anyways, we, we can have a discussion about how that, what that actually means another time. Um, but then you have a phenomenon referred to as convergent evolution, which is basically where you see the same feature when they didn't come from an ancestor. It didn't come from a similar ancestor. So it would be like uh, wings and insects and wings and birds, right? Basically the same structure, the same function, but did not come from the same ancestor, okay? So that'd be an example of convergent evolution. Uh, and so what you, what you find when you see protists and similar structures, for instance, uh, brown algae, green algae, red algae, uh, almost nobody assumes that those all came from a single algal ancestor. Uh, but it rather is an example of convergence, okay, where you have similar structures but didn't come from the same ancestry. And so this is just convergence abounds uh, in, in proteus, which just makes sense. I mean, it's basically just the junk drawer, right? You throw a whole bunch of mess in there and you expect to find some similarities that you can't explain based on common ancestry. And so basically what you have is you, you have six supergroups that contain all of the eukaryotic species, not just protists, but also plants, animals, and fungal uh, species. Contains them all, but they demonstrate what's called a five-way polytomy. And let me show you what a polytomy is. So if you are modeling the evolutionary trajectory of a organism, this is what you want to see. So here's our ancestor. And then here you get a split, and here are your descendants. Okay? And this is what you want to see, because this is the way we see speciation happen. Right? One species becomes two when something happens to make these two groups reproductively isolated from one another. Okay? And it could be some kind of a structural change, but most often it's some kind of a behavioral change that leads to this reproductive isolation, okay? So this is the way we actually see speciation happening. And so if you wanted to model the evolutionary trajectory of a group, this is what you wanna see, because this is the way it happens. This is a polytomy. Ancestor descendants, and this is a polytomy right here, where one branch becomes more than two. This is not the way we see speciation happening. So if you're constructing the evolutionary trajectory of a group and you get a polytomy, that's an indication that something bad is happening. You just don't have any idea of how these groups relate to one another. This is bad, okay? So having a three-way polytomy, this would be a three-way polytomy. One branch becomes three. These six supergroups have a five-way polytomy, meaning that you just, there's, nobody has any idea of how all these groups relate to one another, which is not good evidence that they all do relate to each other, right? Because if they did, they should kind of nest in nice places to, to demonstrate uh, this trajectory. And uh, even this five-way polytomy has branches that, that sh the majority of people <laughs> agree with, but there's an enormous amount of, of disagreement. Okay? And so the simple solution to this, do eukaryotes evidence universal common descent? Well, it, it, they, they don't. They don't at all. And there are a lot of issues there. A lot of instances of convergent evolution, so it's very difficult to tell what did these ancestors look like? Because these same features just appear over and over and over again, but with wildly different ancestries. And then you've got this polytomy, which is not the way speciation happens, an indication that we don't have any idea how these organisms relate to one another. 
and then even this polytomy is, is just a mess. And so here is the six supergroups of eukaryotes. So here's our five-way polytomy. You see that? One branch becoming five. That's really bad. It means you have no idea how these organisms relate. You don't know which one's more primitive. You don't know which ones are, are more derived, right? You don't know what contributed to these splits. This is really bad. And then notice all these dotted lines. All these dotted lines, textbook notes that these are places in which there's a uh, just completely unresolved. Some groups demonstrating different relationships than others, uh, even with the polytome. And so these six supergroups, I'm not telling you that there's no value here, okay? These six supergroups are valuable. They're valuable ways of organizing these organisms based on similar structures or similar life histories. But what I'm telling you is that this is just a big mess. When you try to take all of your eukaryotic organisms and move them back to an original eukaryotic ancestor, it is a huge mess. And I would argue it's because this ancestor never existed. And that's why you're getting a huge mess when you're trying to construct this, because you're trying to illustrate an organism that not only never existed, but actually couldn't exist, because it would be just, it wouldn't make biomechanical sense. Yeah. Uh, oh, wait, did you have a question? I, I saw a hand. I I okay. Did you have a question now? Because um, you seemed like you, you know, yeah, you no, weren't ready. Gonna, but I was going to ask about the, the, not the polytomy, but that one. What is that uh, process called? I, I mean, you could just call it speciation. speciation yeah, okay. speciation of it. Yeah. So basically what the issue is, is that you have an original ancestor, and it comes to a point where that original ancestor has to split at <coughs> once to three different branches. Right, so it's okay to connect three groups together, right? right. And, I, and I think you, you have legitimate cases of that, but this is what you would want. Right. You would want it to look like this. This is good. This is bad. Okay? Because this is how speciation happens. This is not how speciation happens. It would be difficult to even come up with a scenario in which it could happen this way. Yeah? So when you say that this is the way speciation happens, like the way we witness speciation. Yeah. Right? So yep. That's why that's the only way we've witnessed it, so it's only way we can assume it. Well, if you're right, if you're going to adopt a uni uniformitarian perspective on on origins, yeah. you got to be consistent, right? Yeah. And so what you what you'll find then is because of these issues, you'll find people advocating that we just don't know the mechanism of evolution, right? Okay. We can try to model it, but the reason why our models don't work is because we don't know how it actually happens, right? We got we got microevolution down, how allele frequencies change through time and even how speciation can happen, we got that down. But when you're going to go from, like, one big taxon to another, we have no idea the mechanism behind that. And oh, some would argue that there are only certain conditions under which that would happen, um, and so we'll probably never see it, which means we're, there's something missing, right? Just one of the ingredients, we don't know how it works. Although we can talk about some of that because it's, it's kind of fun. So uh, these groups are extremely helpful and uh, are actually beneficial to be able to communicate about. So Excavata, we'll talk about these. Chrome Aviolata, we'll talk about these. Rhizaria, we'll talk a little bit about these. These are just, I mean, yeah, they're really interesting, but they're so remote from our experience uh, that we, we won't deal with them a lot. Archeplastida, we'll actually talk about this a lot when we get into our chapters on plants because this is the group that plants are part of. Uh, Amoebazoa, we'll talk about these a little bit, and then Opistocanta, we'll talk about these a lot because this is a group that both fungi and animals belong to, okay? And so if that's the case, then we should have some evidence of animals sharing some ancestry with these other Opistocons, right? And same thing with fungi. We should have some evidence of them sharing some ancestry with some of these other Opistocons. We'll talk about these a lot because they have a lot of parasitic forms that are really important with regards to human health. And so it's important to know what's going on here. Plus, they're just really interesting. And for a long time, we're kind of put forward as the, the picture of early eukaryotes. Like, this is the group that came from the earliest eukaryotes. And here's what eukaryotes looked like when they first started existing.
very few people believe that now because of a number of issues. Chrome alveolates, these are really important because of uh, how uh, integral they are in terms of uh, making biomolecules available from sunlight. Taking the energy in sunlight and turning it into biomolecules that the rest of us can use and love and cherish. All right? Happy Monday. Enjoy the rest of your day. So it seems like the Linnaean system of taxonomy is pretty much here. It's, it's, it's the way you would think about that is it's, oh, is no. it's being modified. The Linnaean, right, the Linnaean um, taxonomic scheme is, is going through a reorganization. But it, it seems, even though it's based on evolution, it does seem to make more sense. It's more interesting, although it's a lot more complicated.